everybody. You know, it dawns on me that every week we have some guests for the first time at the Compass Church. And so I wanted to extend a warm welcome. We are so grateful you've chosen to visit. Thinking of everybody who's at our South Naperville campus, those at Bolingbrook, Three Rivers, Naperville, Wheaton, and online. Welcome back to the Compass Church and our series entitled, The First Gifts of Christmas. Friends, I've been reading this local travel guide. I love travel guides. Uh, they point out, among other things, fine art museums. I was just reading a, a, an extensive piece on the, uh, the Art Institute of Chicago, and I'm familiar with much of the art referenced in this guide, but there's some local pieces that I never knew about. In fact, I read of a famous sculpture here in Wilmington, Illinois. Friends, this sculpture is of a man. It was created back in 1960, which is 62 years ago. And it was made by a famous artist by the name of William A. Swan. Swan is brilliant in his capacity to make the human figure explode with vital life. This piece of art is so well loved that people have tried to buy it. They have offered big money, but the owners hold on to their masterpiece and will not sell it. Uh, thousands of people travel to Wilmington every year just to admire and appreciate this sculpture. You know, monumental sculptures are very common. We think of them in Italy and in France, but big sculptures in Illinois, that's pretty rare. You would agree. We need to see this piece of art. Come on, let's go take a look. Well, if you ever plan to motor west, Jack, take my way, it's the highway, that's the best. Get your kicks on Route 66. Friends, that's the sculpture. It's called the Gemini Giant, and it's a 30-foot fiberglass masterpiece. I actually found it in my travel guide, which focuses on Route 66. It turns out this famous road is filled with masterpieces like the Gemini Giant, or the 70-foot bottle of ketchup, or the 40-foot rocking chair, or the 80-foot concrete blue whale. Oh, Route 66 is filled with many visual delights. Get your kicks on Route 66. Friends, it turns out that sometimes descriptions fail to communicate. You can read about this sculpture all day long, and yet your perceptions will be off until you see it. You see the difference? You gotta sometimes see it with your own eyes. And interesting, when it comes to the Bible and to God, sometimes the dynamic is the same. In the Old Testament era, the believers had to rely on the descriptions of God that were provided by the prophets. These prophets would use words as best they could to describe the heart of God. We New Testament believers are so blessed because in addition to the Old Testament descriptions, we can see Jesus Christ. You realize that Christ is God in human flesh. Christmas is all about the incarnation, the decision of God to come and walk among us. And he had a number of reasons for coming to visit, but one of them is so that we would know what he is like. Friends, with Christ, we see him interacting with people and see his heart on display. We see him facing hardships and having vision. The, the very nature of God is best revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And so, friends, let's return to our series called The First Gifts of Christmas, looking specifically at frankincense and what it has to tell us about Jesus Christ.
You may recall that this series called First Gifts of Christmas is taking a look at the gold, frankincense, and myrrh that were given to Jesus. And uh, it turns out those three symbolize very central aspects of his identity. Do you remember last week we looked at gold and gold symbolized royalty. Gold was the number one gift for a king. And Jesus is born king, not locally, but king of the universe. Well, this week we are looking at frankincense. Frankincense, do you recall, it is this extraction from a tree in Arabia. And the, the extraction will be f turned into like a resin, a resin that can burn. And when it burns, it, it smells so good. In fact, in the Old Testament, we find that frankincense was offered on the incense altar in the temple, right in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And that Incense was a sweet aroma that was uh, brought to God and it's worship for him. And so frankincense was a gift for God. And this speaks to the fact that Jesus is God. They, they gave a gift to God in, in the person of Jesus Christ. The deity of Jesus. I know this is hard to wrap our minds around. But the baby born at Christmas, lying in the manger at Bethlehem, is God in human flesh. It was proclaimed that his name would be Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. And sure enough, Jesus is God with us. Friends, uh, this question of why would God need to visit planet Earth? That's a very important question. And there are a number of biblical reasons why it was important for God to join our planet and walk here. The first is the cross of Christ. God needed to be the one to die for us if he was going to be a suitable substitute for the punishment that should have been ours, but graciously was put upon him. We're going to learn about the cross next week when we look at myrrh. So I won't talk about that. But uh, another reason is that God came to earth so that he could have sympathy of the highest level, so that he could walk in our moccasins. Some of you are like, yeah, I think I remember moccasins. That's right. Our last series called Egypt in the final week. We looked at that as one of the reasons that God came to planet earth. But there's a third reason that we're going to look at today. And I'll, I'll call this reason revelation. God came to planet Earth to reveal his true nature, to help us understand what he's like. He, he knew that if we could see Jesus, we could understand him better. Let, let me uh, read to you a number of verses, actually, that point to this role of Christ's incarnation, that he came to reveal the nature of God. John 1, 18 says this. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, that's Jesus, who is himself God, what a bold proclamation of the deity of Jesus, he has made him known. No one's seen God, but Jesus has made him known. Isn't that great? Colossians 1, 15 says this. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Perfectly stated. How about this one? John 14, verse 8. Philip said to Christ, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Christ came to show the disciples and us what God the Father is like. He being the second person of the Trinity is a perfect reflection of the attributes that are true of God. One more, Hebrews 1, verse 1. It says, long ago, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. And now he has spoken to us through his son, the sun radiates God's glory and expresses the very character of God. Isn't that a beautiful passage? It's making a contrast of these two forms of revelation. 
It's in the Old Testament. God was described to us through the words of the prophet. We've already mentioned how descriptions, like the description of the Gemini giant found in this travel guide, it's helpful, but a description can't compare with the opportunity to look at the Gemini giant directly. And similarly with God, Old Testament descriptions are precious, but they run the risk of failing to communicate accurately. They just can't compare with the privilege of seeing God incarnate, seeing God with flesh on, seeing Jesus. In fact, this contrast between the descriptions of the prophets and the, the Jesus before our very eyes, we, we see the problem of the Old Testament alone in some of the encounters that Jesus had. What I mean by that is when you look at Christ's life on earth, it's evident that there were misconceptions of God's identity that had arisen among God's people in Jesus' day based on Old Testament alone. And Jesus needed to correct those misconceptions of what God is like. Let's dive into what I see as the number one misconception, shall we? We're going to study this out of Luke 19. And let me read the first verse, first couple actually. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector. Here we go. Tax collectors. Friends, the great rub of Jesus Christ is that he loved tax collectors. In fact, it's fascinating how the, the role of tax collectors in the day of Jesus was epitomized as the worst of sinners. Do you know there are 18 times in the four Gospels that tax collectors are viewed and offered as like the epitome of wickedness? Let me touch base on this role that Zacchaeus had, maybe helping us understand why they were viewed as such sinful people. Here's the deal. The, the Jews, all of Israel, is under the oppression of the evil Roman Empire. Rome has conquered the whole Mediterranean world. And one of the things that they needed to do to run this massive empire was tax their conquered peoples ruthlessly. And how do you do that? How do you get taxes from all these conquered peoples? Well, what they did is they employed some of those conquered peoples to tax their brothers and sisters. Uh, it was a terrible job in that you were turning your back on your own people. You were saying, I want to get a big paycheck from Rome so badly that I'll start walking around my own Israelite foe and I will demand taxation on account of Caesar. And so uh, tax collectors were viewed as traitors who had turned on their own people. They were viewed as liars. Here's how payment was uh, arrived at. Uh, Caesar, the Roman Empire, would say, you need to get this much tax out of this region. However much you want to say that they need to pay, that's fine. You can keep for yourself the balance over what we the empire demand. And so tax collectors were known for lying through their teeth and saying, you owe this and you owe that, and just expanding the amount they demanded so they could pad their own pocketbook. How about that, huh? In addition to being liars, they were viewed as being thieves. They were ruthless. All these sins were combined in this one job description. And so in this day, the most evil people in the world were tax collectors. And Jesus loved them. In fact, I'm going to jump ahead to the end for a moment. I'll just tell you that this tax collector, this chief tax collector named Zacchaeus, is going to enjoy the company and friendship of Jesus Christ. Jesus always was hanging out and loving on the worst of sinners. 
And what happens is that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, rebuke Jesus again and again, saying, you shouldn't be loving these folks. Let me jump to the end and read to you what's going to happen in verse 7. It says this, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he, Jesus, has gone to be the guest of a sinner. And in this case, it says all the people were were saying that. Usually it's the Pharisees, which is a sect of real holiness and spiritual devotion. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the theologians. Do you know, eight times in the Gospels, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees are said to rebuke Jesus for his love of tax collectors and sinners. They are like, Jesus, you don't understand the heart of God. God hates sinners. Jesus is like, don't tell me I don't understand the heart of God. I am God. And I'm telling you, God loves sinners. And they would fight about this. The the religious teachers would say, I can't believe that he eats with them. You know, that was viewed as socially inappropriate. They called him a friend of drunkards and sinners. They called him a guest of sinners. They said, I can't believe he welcomes sinners. They were vocal in their opposition to Jesus, claiming he didn't understand God's heart towards wayward people. And Jesus is like, no, you guys don't get it. And you know, Christ was right. They had misunderstood the description of Jesus found by their prophets in the Old Testament. This love for tax collectors that Jesus was modeling. It is described in the Old Testament. This gracious disposition towards sinful people. It's all over in the Old Testament. One of the places it's most clearly demonstrated is in a repeated description of God uh, that's been called the divine attribute formula. Well, let me read it to you. Maybe you'll recognize these words. The, these Statements say, God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, forgiving of sin. These divine attributes that are are put into this recurring formula, they are found eight different places in the Old Testament in eight different books of the Old Testament. Exodus, Numbers, Second Chronicles, Nehemiah, Psalm, Joel, Jonah, Nahum. They all include this formula. God repeatedly says, let me describe what I'm like. And this gracious, forgiving love for even those who are sinners is described with words. But just like the description of the Gemini giants, sometimes words, whew, they go in one ear and out the other. We... We fail to grasp them as true, and we need to see it. Well, sure enough, this divine attribute formula is seen in the person of Jesus and how he interacted with people like Zacchaeus. Friends, let's, in fact, look at how Jesus loved Zacchaeus, shall we? Going back to Luke 19, now verse 3. Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was. I got to pause. That's awkward. He wanted to see who Jesus was. It doesn't say he wanted to say, see Jesus. Remember, Jesus was passing through Jericho, his town. If it had just said he wanted to see Jesus, that would have made sense to me. But it says he wanted to see who Jesus was. The the Greek that's translated in this way is is rather awkward. It technically says this. He wanted to see Jesus who he was. In other words, seeing Jesus was not enough. He wanted to see what kind of a person Jesus was. He was fascinated by the the rumors on the street regarding the heart of Christ and what Christ said about the heart of God, the Father. In fact, one of the rumors on the street 
was that Jesus loved tax collectors just like Zacchaeus. In fact, it had been said that one of his 12 disciples was a tax collector. You may know that Matthew, that's his occupation prior to Christ calling him to become a disciple. And so Zacchaeus is like, I got to see what this guy is like. I've got to see if the rumors are true. Is it possible that God loves people even like me? That's what Zacchaeus was wondering. Let's go back to the verse. Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree. <laughs> To see Jesus. I just love this. Can't you see this short man despised by everybody he knows, climbing a tree, searching for this one who is said to be passing through his town with hope in his heart? Is it possible that the rumors of extravagant love in the heart of God as revealed by this teacher Jesus that stands in contrast to the religious teachers of the day could Jesus be right that God loves people even like me? Isn't that fun? Picture him just wanting to get a glimpse of Jesus. Let me read what happens. It says in verse 5, When Jesus reached the spot, that is the spot where this tree is with Zacchaeus up in it, Jesus looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. One of my favorite passages of scripture. Uh, that verse is just packed with meaningful details. In fact, I want to highlight one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight of those words. When he reached the spot, it's like Jesus got to that spot and he just knew Zacchaeus was there. Jesus was aware of Zacchaeus. And I might add, he's aware of us too. We may feel overlooked by the Lord, but it ain't so. Even if you're a sinner, the Lord is aware in a compassionate way about you. And then I highlighted looked, that eye contact. Oh, can you imagine when Christ turns his eyes up and makes eye contact with Zacchaeus and he makes eye contact with us as well. Zacchaeus, how did he know his name? Don't you love this? He just says, I know you, Zacchaeus. We've never met before, but I know you and I know your name. Come down. That's the invitation of Christ for Zacchaeus to draw near him. Why down? Because Jesus is there. Come to me. I want to be with you, Christ is saying. Come down immediately. I mean, there's urgency in what Christ says. That urgency is in the word must. I must stay at your house. Stay. That points to Jesus saying, I want to be with you. I enjoy spending time with you, Zacchaeus. And I want to stay with you today. This day is a day when Zacchaeus will enjoy hanging out with Christ, God incarnate. What a verse. Yes, the Old Testament had the divine attribute formula describing the extravagant love of God, but Jesus models it here so beautifully. Verse 6 says that Zacchaeus came down at once and welcomed Jesus gladly. Brought him to his house, had him as his guest, they laughed and told stories and ate food and enjoyed the afternoon together. Friends, the heart of God, what is it like? The Old Testament described it. Oh, God has a compassion and a grace, a forgiveness of sinners. That is mind-blowing. But that description only worked so far in convincing us that it is so. The example of Jesus living in our midst and treating sinners like Zacchaeus in this way, it shows us, it helps us believe it, it helps us experience it. Speaking of experiencing it, I'll just be a little transparent here with my own struggles to enjoy the love of God for a sinner like me and Zacchaeus. I'm not a tax collector, but like you, 
I am a sinner, aware of my own moral failure. In fact, here's the struggle I've been having lately. In this Christmas season, I can't get it all done. There's too much to do. All these presents and house decorations. I don't have any lights on my house right now. And my wife is not pleased about it. And I'm not pleased with myself. And I got Christmas Eve services to prepare for. And in this Christmas season, I think we all can relate to being frustrated that we can't get it all done. And in my own frustration with myself... I'm not happy with myself. How can God be happy with me? Do you see what I mean? And so as a result, I'm not feeling love for self. I'm definitely not imagining love from God. I'm the one who's failing right now. And friends, in moments like this, I have to fight to convince myself that God loves me and is delighting in me. And his uh, interaction with Zacchaeus helps me do just that. These days I've been sitting down to pray going, hey, Lord, I'm failing to get it all done. And yet I remind myself that the Lord's aware, just as the Lord was aware that Zacchaeus was in that tree, the Lord's aware of where I'm at and what I'm going through. And he's quite compassionate towards me. And he's looking at me saying, Jeff, let's spend some time together. I'm looking at you. Just as I looked at Zacchaeus, Jeff Griffin, I'm making eye contact with you. And God's using my name. As he used the name of Zacchaeus, he's saying, come on, Jeff, Jeff. Jesus Christ forming the sounds of my name in his mouth. It's a crazy thought. I hope you're considering it because it's true. Jeff, come out of this crazy, frantic, rushing Christmas season and be with me. I must spend some time with you, Jeff, because I enjoy you. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around that truth about God's heart, but I must fight to connect with it because it's true and it'll change everything in my heart if I will experience the truth of who God is. And friends, you've got to fight for it too. God says, you people don't understand what I am like. My love is amazing, and it's not rooted in your worthiness. See, that's the problem. We're so used to love being earned. Well, Zacchaeus didn't earn God's love. The love of God is for sinners like him and like us. And so we need to press into a love that just doesn't make sense, but is so true. How do we know it's true? Because in the Old Testament, God's heart was described as such. And in the New Testament, we see see frankincense. A gift for baby Jesus because he is God. He came to show us what God is like. And God is many things. He is love for sinners like you and me. May that pierce our hearts with great joy this Christmas. Will you pray with me? Lord, we are so grateful that you are on a mission to reveal your true nature to us and that Jesus came in part to show us what you're like. And Lord, this little tour of your heart, your extravagant love that's not based on worthiness but based on your unique capacity to love sinners, We love that about you. There's nothing that thrills us as much as your grace-based love. And we just want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for being our father and friend, being our companion, Lord and Savior. We want to enjoy your tender compassion even this Christmas. Would you help us? experience in the days ahead what Zacchaeus experienced in Luke 19. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.